The, the way that the former referendum was conducted was a disaster. There was so much complacency about that the law governing it was totally inadequate to control what happened. Had it been comparable to the law governing elections, the, the Leave campaign could not have got away with so much that they did, and they themselves admit that. So here we have a, a panel of people with different expertises on the construction of the right sort of referendum. First of all, we have Jessica Seymour QC, who was part of, from this point of view, part of the Gina Miller team, which successfully fought the case against the royal prerogative being taken and forced the vote about Article 50 back to Parliament, and has written a superb article in The Guardian about that whole subject, and so I welcome her. Secondly, we have, well known to us in least, Professor A.C. Grayling, who in the last couple of years, I think, has done nothing but fight the case and fight the good fight for United Europe and for the UK and Europe. So it's always good to have applause before you speak, I think, yes. <laughs> and the third panel panelist is uh, Paul Tyler, who has been a, a liberal colleague of mine, uh, horrified to see for 54 years. And uh, he is a member of the House of Lords and is particularly concerned with constitutional business and the way you construct a, a proper constitution in this country. And so it's a very great pleasure uh, to ask, first of all, Paul Tyler to speak to us. I'm going to stand if this works all right. Can everybody hear all right, okay? No, all right, I'll sit down again. Let's see if that works better. Is that better? Yes. Good. I like to be able to see you. I don't care whether you can see me or not. Um, back in, uh, in uh, January, we had the opening stages of the EU withdrawal bill in the House of Lords, and a highly respected crossbencher somebody who really speaks with huge authority in the Lords, because he's the former clerk to the House of Commons, said this. This is Lord Lisvane. In a parliamentary system of government, I am no friend of referendums, and I recall Attlee's excori excoriating criticism of them, which was quoted by Margaret Thatcher. I have sympathy with the noble Lord Lord Adonis in not understanding why, when it's all right to ask the people once, it's not all right to ask them again. Not the same question, of course, but to see whether they are content with what has been achieved in their name. Indulge me for a minute, my lords. It is though I have three elderly and extremely nervous aunts of whom I'm very fond. I decide to give them a treat and ask them to discuss what they would like to do. They have a discussion and arrive at a democratic solution, which is that they would like to go to the cinema tomorrow. I look in the local paper and discover that the only films on offer are Reservoir Dogs and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> what am I going to say to my highly nervous, indeed squeamish, but much loved aunts? You must stick with your democratic decision. <laughs> or do I say, now you know what's on offer, what do you think? <laughs> that is my text my friends, this afternoon. And for many of us now in the House of Lords, we refer for brevity to the dilemma of Lord Lisvane's aunts. <laughs> now, there is a double risk which we should all face, and the real experts will talk a bit more about this in a minute. One is, of course, that we are told that there is no time to produce the necessary legislation, to have the necessary preparatory period, and to have a people's vote. And the other is that because of that time constraint, or because somebody has an ulterior motive, that Michael's referred to this, we are left with the totally inadequate legislation under which the 2016 referendum was arranged. And I want to quickly address some of the issues that arise from that, and then later on come back to the issue of is it going to happen? I think, incidentally, the odds have changed dramatically. As a realist, at the beginning of this year, I thought there was a 10% chance. I now think it's about 50-50, and every day seems to get it mm. more likely. So I have been working over the last two or three weeks 
with the Constitution Unit at UCL, who provided the Secretariat for the report of the Independent Commission on referendums. It's very ugly, isn't it? I like referenda yeah. much better. Now, I'm not going to read this to you. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear. But it is online, if you wish to refer to it. It is a very authoritative report. And the, the reference group that uh, supervised it included people of all sorts of expertise and all views on the particular issue of the last referendum. So what I want to do just very briefly is to illustrate to you the sort of concerns that we have in drafting a new bill in time for the moment when I think there will have to be a, a, a parliamentary decision to have another referendum and to indicate the sort of approaches and priorities that we are already looking at. And I hope, since we're still in very early stages of this exercise, you, you, will be able to contribute during questions and comments later as to what you think are the priorities. Let me just sketch out some of the issues. Obviously, the spending concerns are of huge importance. Uh, they were inadequately dealt with under the previous legislation. And it may be that there is some concerns about the lack of clarity. I don't actually share that because I think it was proved subsequently that the behavior of some of the campaigners, the campaigners showed that they did understand only too well what the law said, but they were prepared to break the law. But it's clear that we have to tackle that issue. And in particular, we have to tackle the issue of the online communications to the public, the unsolicited material of all sorts that came online, which of course was never signed. Those of you who are involved in any other form of electoral process will know that we have to put an imprint on every printed bit of material that is sent to an elector. There is absolutely no reason why that should not be identified to in terms of uh, the communications that come online. That was recommended by the Electoral Commission uh, long ago, more than a decade ago. It was actually implemented. It was shown to be practical during the Scottish referendum of 2014, and it is an absolute essential, in my view. I think it is outrageous that electors are not told who is talking to them. And that, of course, applies... <laughs> there is, of course, a link with the whole issue of restrictions on funding. There are clear rules against the investment in the United Kingdom's electoral process by foreign organizations and governments, and that must come out into the open. Transparency is absolutely essential if we are to get this right next time. It was not there in 2016, and it must be there next time. Every so often, ministers and others say, oh, well, it doesn't really matter because there's no proof that these communications have any impact. Oh, yes. Well, let me tell you that in 2015, the Conservatives spent 2.2 million, rising to 3.8 million on these materials. Labour spent slightly less than 370,000 uh, 370, in 2015, but well over 1.1 million in 2017. And the Lib Dems, of course, too poor, but they still did their best. It was more modest. But most significantly, the Remain group spent 3.9 million on the referendum, and the Leavers 4.5 million on this exclusive online communication. Now, if that was worthless, if it didn't have any impact, if it didn't do any good, if it didn't persuade anybody to do anything, somebody was wasting a one hell of a lot of money. <laughs> And I think, therefore, the argument that this doesn't really matter does not hold water. So we will be looking very carefully at ways in which we can make that truly effective. The, Constitution, uh, the, Constitution, the Constitution Unit and uh, the uh, Commission had a whole number of concerns about being fair to both sides. I want to be fair to the electorate, to the citizens of this country. I'm not in the business as the sort of false balance that if some of the proposals that we put in this draft bill seem to be more careful in terms of dealing with the past behavior on one side and the other, 
I don't believe that's the issue. You may have seen today that the BBC has at last admitted that they have given up on false balance on the issue of uh, climate change. You know, if every scientist in the world is convinced that man-made uh, climate change is a real problem, and Lord Lawson is the one only other person on the other side, <laughs> that somehow you've got to have him in to the studio every time there's any concern on that issue. Well, I don't believe that, and I don't think it should be the case here. Surely what we should be doing is to make sure that the actual process of asking the public their views is as fair and as balanced and as legal as we as citizens and parliament have decided it should be. So on those circumstances, I think that it's very important that we should deal with that on that basis. And one other issue, yes, it would be good to extend the franchise. I successfully uh, steered through the House of Lords the extension of the franchise for 16 and 17 year olds for the EU referendum, only to have it stopped by the government in the House of Commons. Similarly, one of my colleagues did the same for uh, UK citizens in the EU. I think that will have to be a second stage part of this process, because if we put it in at the beginning, it will be such a change from 2016, it will be thought not to be a comparable result. I should be very interested to hear what you've got to say, and indeed others have got to say. So that gives you some indication of the way in which our thinking is going. But th this is the last point I want to make to you. On Monday, I asked a question of a minister in the Lords on these issues, and I asked, does the minister not recognize that these challenges to which reference has been made are particularly relevant to a referendum campaign as we've learned to our cost? Given that there is obviously now no potential majority in the House of Commons for any Brexit outcome of any sort, there's an increasing likelihood of the necessity of going back to the public and having a people's vote. What steps should or can now be taken, at least to look at the recommendations of the Independent Commission on Referendums and the recommendations of the Electoral Commission uh, so that we can have some legislation in place if and when we have another vote. And the minister said, I agree with the noble lord that we should be prepared to deal with these issues. There is no prospect of any of the current options receiving a majority in the House of Commons. In those circumstances, the likelihood that we're going to need another referendum is, I think, absolutely certain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And now we'd ask Jessica Seymour to follow. Thank you. Um, it's great to be here this afternoon. <clears throat> so thank you, Lord Tyler. You've covered a, a lot of the issues I was going to touch on. The obvious first issue is how, can you hear me now? Better? Uh, how actually are we going to get a vote? Uh, and that really is dependent on all of us, uh, you especially, all of us here, uh, talking to our friends, contacting our MPs, uh, keep pushing and pushing very hard now. In practical terms, there are problems in Parliament, uh, but there, will, there must be a way, and I don't want to go into the intricacies of how we can get there, uh, but essentially, if there is a withdrawal agreement, uh, the legislation, the 2017 Act, provides that there has to be a domestic act of parliament to give effect to that agreement. Now, that act can easily be amended to provide for a referendum in order for it to come into force. So if we don't get an agreement, if we're in a no-deal situation, it's far more complex. On the other hand, we know that parliament will not agree to no deal. So we would then expect parliament to find some kind of mechanism to ensure uh, a vote or indeed to vote itself uh, to stop Brexit. Timing. Um, the Constitutional Unit report, which is very useful, and they've also tweeted out their sort of flowchart of how we get there, uh, says, uh, and actually I think it's an earlier blog, but it says 
that if the legislation is not laid before the 8th of October, or rather if it is laid on the 8th of October, uh, then we would have a referendum on the 28th of March. And that's because of the parliamentary um, and, and legislative controls on periods required within the referendum. So we're talking the day before uh, Brexit. Uh, and therefore, there is a time problem. And the reality is we would have to have an extension of time from the EU, but the general consensus I've heard, uh, I know nothing directly, is that that uh, could be possible or would be possible. On the franchise issue, um, there are three, I think, major issues on franchise. One is those British citizens living in the EU for more than 15 years who never got a vote and are, who, are, who are massively affected by Brexit. I mean, they may lose their uh, health care, their pensions are affected, etc. Now, um, there, there, there's that group, there's the younger voters, and then there are EU citizens here whose home is Britain. They were also excluded. I agree that there is a problem to push for any different franchise. Uh, because ultimately, if uh, Remain succeeds on a subsequent vote, we have to uh, accept and realize that it needs to look fair. Uh, and it might be said, well, it can't be fair, although there'd be a good argument against that. Uh, so I think we may have to just accept that uh, we're going to have a, a referendum that was as inadequate as the last one, if we're going to get one at all. Then there's the question, do we have a three-way question or a two-way question? Um, then there's the spending issue, and I'm actually involved in the case against the Electoral Commission that led them to reopen the investigation into uh, Vote Leave and Leave.eu because they'd closed investigations twice into that spending, and it was as a result of that challenge that they reopened it. But there is a pending issue in that case uh, in which we've been waiting now for three months on a judgment as to how the legislation works in terms of donations between campaigns. So that's another important spending issue uh, because the Electoral Commission told campaigns, or rather told at least the Vote Leave campaign, that it was perfectly fine for Vote Leave to give um, goods and services to other leave campaigns without accounting for the costs of those goods and services. And that included expenditure on AIQ, which was the data analytics um, firm that was used. And then there is the very important Facebook uh, dark ads um, data analytics point. And I would be surprised, again, if this is solved in time. So we may, putting a pessimistic line on it, we may end up with a um, a similarly inadequate vote, but I think we just have to push for a vote now and um, deal with that when we get to it. Thank you very much. And now Professor Grayling. Well, thank you very much. Well, of course, uh, Lord Tyler and Jessica have uh, said it all, so I feel a bit like that Hungarian MP who very, very late in a long debate in the Hungarian parliament, stood up and said, everything has been said, but not everybody has said it yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in, in that position. <clears throat> now, I fully endorse uh, uh, everything that Lord Tyler says. I think Jessica's raised some extremely important points. I just want to, to, to uh, mention the following. It is not outside the competence of our parliament to expedite matters on a second referendum, on another vote. If there is the will, there is the way. They can do it. They don't have to stick to the uh, current uh, um, timetables and regulations. They can get on with this uh, if there is a will. And I think uh, uh, it could be, uh, it's not impossible, that some sort of will is emerging because, as uh, Lord Tyler says, there is no majority for any form of no deal or uh, vassal state deal or blind Brexit or fudgy Brexit uh, in, in uh, the House of Commons. Um, we know that the House of Lords, since it's full of sensible people, has always been against Brexit anyway. So if the um, uh, proposition that there should be a people's vote uh, comes to be taken very seriously in Parliament, and I think increasingly it is, really huge uh, important point is whether the Labour Party will uh, go in favour of, uh, of, of a people's vote, That's, uh, that would be a game changer. But it is not outside the competence of Parliament to speed it up. 
If and when it happens, <clears throat> we really do need to confront this, uh, the, these two very important issues. One is, who is to be given the franchise for that? Because uh, as Lord Tyler says, it would seem to be appropriate to have the same uh, electorate as there was before in 2016, so that you get a comparison. But on the other hand, the 2016 referendum had a profound injustice uh, embodied in it, which was that those three constituencies of people already mentioned, the young 16 and 17 year olds, uh, the uh, EU uh, citizens, fellow citizens from other parts of the EU, we're still part of the EU, and our own expats living abroad were denied a voice. That is a profound injustice. They have a material interest in the outcome of such a referendum and they should be given a say. And so when that question is discussed, uh, that needs to be looked at. And then of course the second point is the point about the clarity uh, of outcome of the referendum. Because the 2016 referendum was, and, and in fact this was uh, told to members of parliament, on the floor of the House of Commons on the 16th of June 2015 when the referendum bill was being discussed by the then Minister for Europe, Mr. Liddington, that the referendum was advisory only, which was why they did not put in a threshold or a supermajority. This is unacceptable because if you think about the fact that 37%, only 37% of the total electorate, that restricted electorate for the 2016 referendum voted to leave, and it was treated as mandating by the government of the day, whereas it takes a 40% vote of the total membership of a trades union to have a strike, and a 66% majority of the House of Commons to have a dissolution of parliament outside the terms of, of a, a parliament. When you think of those facts, you, you see that this is an absolute travesty. We need to have clarity, we need to be sure that the uh, outcome <coughs> of the referendum will be clearly understood before it is held. And finally, on the question, there has to be a remain option. My own view is that it should be a binary question. Do we continue with this uh, lunatic process? That is how it should be phrased. <laughs> or, or should we remain? So however it's phrased, it should be a binary option between uh, something and remain. I think that we should press for this. We should work extremely hard to make this happen. We should press Parliament to get on with it, to, uh, you know, act as it can, it has plenty of discretion to, to expedite this, uh, and to include all those people who have a real interest in the outcome because it affects their future and their well-being. So I think we should go for this, we should, we should press it. Now people will say, what can we do to help? And I'll end on this point. We were told just the uh, other day by um, a, a very distinguished uh, member of parliament what works in the way of uh, pressure on MPs. And MPs, as you know, on the whole, there are some very good MPs, but on the whole, they're a pusillanimous lot. And what they tend to be most nervous of is public opinion going against uh, what, what it is that's, that's happening in Westminster. Write to your MP is the usual advice but it is very good advice because when MPs get lots and lots of letters on a particular subject, it does begin to make them nervous. And what we should be doing is making them extremely nervous. You may have heard that MPs will say to their staff, if you get a letter from the same, or lots of letters from the same person on the same subject, just bin them. My response to that is to say, make their bins overflow constantly. And eventually they will start to get the point. But we're told, <clears throat> We're told that MPs will, will uh, um, not really pay as much attention to people outside their constituencies as people inside their constituencies for very good reason. So you must pester your own MP, but you must also pester all your friends and relatives and business contacts and everybody you know in other constituencies to do the same thing. And then a very powerful thing you can do is to get businesses in the constituency, small, medium, and large businesses in the constituency to lobby their MPs, to invite their MPs to come and visit them so that they can explain to them the problems they're going to face with Brexit. Because you can well believe it, everybody is going to be facing serious problems if there is a Brexit. Get the MPs to come. We were told that an MP simply cannot refuse to go to visit a business in a constituency if they're asked to do so. So this is a powerful tool. 
And what we've got to do is to lobby and lobby and lobby more and more and more vociferously over these next few weeks and couple of months because we're coming up to a crucial moment in the autumn this year. And in order to get the message across that a people's vote is now an absolute necessity, that's what you must do. Don't not do it. Do it. We've got to make this work and get that people's vote. Thank you. Well, thank you for two or uh, three speakers. Now, it's over to you. We have a colleague here with a, a microphone, so when you indicate, he will rush to your aid. If a question you want to ask is directed to particular on one of the three speakers, say so. Otherwise, we'll uh, attempt to move it round the table. Who was the first questioner? I'll take the one right at the back first, the gentleman with the glasses. He is rushing to you with the microphone here. It's going very slowly, actually. Julian Rowan from Sheffield Europe, for Europe. My question is, Of course, yes. Yes, I, I think that's a very good point because, uh, um, indeed, we already see the straws in the wind on this. Firstly, all this talk about a no deal and stockpiling and Operation Yellow Hammer is just to frighten everybody into accepting any deal that, that is a deal that isn't a no deal. So we mustn't be... We, we mustn't be conned by that. One thing you can be 100,000% certain of is that there won't be a no deal. There's just no support for that in Parliament or in the country. So th 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 this is, a, this is a, a con to get us to accept some kind of a fudge. And the fudge which appears to be emerging is that the, the, uh, uh, the May government gets... Germany and France to agree to a sort of two-page vague outline, and we'll fill in the details later. A blind Brexit or a blindfold Brexit. Exactly the same as the 2016 referendum. No plan, no idea, no roadmap, no, no sense of what's going to happen. All that it's going to do is to prolong the uncertainty, more businesses leaving, more jobs lost, more, more fudge and bother. And we won't give up fighting either. So this, this uh, uh, you know, problem that we have in the country now of it being divided and unsettled will continue and perhaps worsen. So one thing that we have to make absolutely clear to all our friends and neighbours, to our MPs and to everybody we talk to, is that any kind of Brexit, and any kind of Brexit is the toxic thing. We want to have a say. Do we go on with that process or do we stop it now? I think the questioner is absolutely right and the answer you've just been given is absolutely right. Just add one word from within Parliament. There is no majority in either House of Parliament for that sort of cross uh, shortcut because it would be a disaster for the reasons that have just been explained. But the time is in, uh, is in the next week or two. It is really, really urgent now because the so-called meaningful vote that is due to take place in the House of Commons, and we'll have a vote in the House of Lords, it'll be up to you to say whether that's meaningful or not. But in due course, MPs are going to have to decide whether they're being given a genuine choice on your behalf, and it's up to you to make sure that that is a genuine choice. Thank you. Another question. Can we come forward to the lady here, please? That's right there. Hello, Caroline Kenyon. I'm the young girl of that parliamentary spokesperson for Lincoln. First, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody on the panel, one for your clarity and two for the absolute dedication that you've given to this huge cause over the last two years. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I think that's an incredibly difficult question because it's certainly become clear to me um, through speaking to people like Chris Lillico and um, uh, that uh, technology is so far ahead of the law. And uh, he said to me, look, I speak to MPs, I speak to um, policy people, people in the ICO, information commissioner's officer, they haven't a clue how this stuff works. Uh, so essentially, we are really dependent on GCHQ for, for this. I mean, they're the only people who are really going to understand how this all works. Uh, the DCMS have produced a, a first report, you probably saw it, produced in July, which is an ex, you know, it's an extraordinary report, 80-page report. There is also the Mueller investigation coming out. Uh, but in terms of um, another vote, uh, I, I actually have no idea how we can protect ourselves technologically from this. Um, I think that ultimately is a, uh, an issue for our security services. <laughs> Just very briefly to add to that, the select committee to which Jessica has referred has done some very good work on this, and so has GCHQ. Yeah. I think what's most interesting is what the Irish government did for the recent abortion referendum, where they say, they claim, that they were able to exclude, with the help of the various platforms, all foreign interference. Now, whether they actually did, I don't know. We'll have to look at that very carefully. But if it can be done, they look as if they've made a very good stab at it. Okay. Yes, I mean, one, one of the very, very, very few good things to come out of all this is that we know that it happens. And so it's kind of armed us against it. And uh, uh, as uh, Lord Tyler just says, there are some technological things that can be done, but also awareness on the part of people that this is the case. And by the way, it's terribly important uh, to, to be informed about how just how this works, because um, as you be aware, in any vote, in any election, any referendum, there's going to be two blocks of people, you know, one for, one against, one yes, one no, one in, one out. Um, and these uh, uh, elections and referendums are won on pretty small margins and rather small numbers of people changing their mind and moving one way or another. And it's those small groups of people who are very, very expertly identified by the pattern of their behavior on, in, the, in cyberspace and who are targeted with these messages. And so it's really important that, that we should be able to, to, to counter that in a variety of ways, especially with information. The second thing I'd add here, by the way, it's not just the internet, not just cyberspace, but I think betting on the outcome of referendums and elections ought to be outlawed because in the case of the, of the 2016 referendum, all the betting companies were saying it was over an 80% certainty that, that uh, Remain would win. And that kept some people at home. You know, if, you, if you're a sophologist and you know about voting behavior, you know that if it rains in a constituency on polling day, that the turnout in that constituency will drop by a very predictable percentage amount. In London, it bucketed with rain the whole day, 23rd of June 2016. The drop in the turnout in London alone was larger than the margin by which leave won. And so it's terribly important that we alert people to the fact that they mustn't be dissuaded by betting and polling and so on uh, to, to think, well, one side is going to win, so I'm on that side, but I don't need to vote. Or we make sure that our supporters are more waterproof than theirs, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, please. Let's come further forward again. This gentleman here, that you, yes. The microphone is arriving rapidly. Okay. 
Never mind. Yeah. Oh, hello. Yes, yeah, on. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm, well, loud, obviously, I'm very loud. Um, I'm really, really annoyed about the injustice of the people that were not allowed to vote, especially young people. Um, I understand the arguments as to why we can't look at a way of getting them included into the people's vote. I, I do understand that. Um, but also, I th <clears throat> so I'm kind of, I'm not quite decided on that myself. Um, but it's certainly if we can exclude those three groups of people, uh, we're looking at the same number of people the same number in the electorates um, and my concern really is that uh, do we have the sophisticated marketing that's going to get the messages through because that was obviously lacking on the Remain side and the Leave side was just phenomenal I've, I've seen the stuff they've put together it's absolutely I mean it's, as, a, as a marketing exercise absolutely tremendous um, we have to be that sophisticated we have to be that clever, not just with the technology, but the types of messages and the strategy. And I just, I just wonder where that's coming from, because we haven't got a, a political party that's standing up for Brexit. Brexit. Uh, Labour say they, 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 they are, uh, for, for, for Remain, but Labour say they are. So that's, you know, wh wh where, where is that grouping and where is that sophisticated marketing going to come from? I don't know if you had any ideas on that. I hesitate to comment on parties in favour of this, but anyway. tell us where you're from. Uh, Jared Gaines, uh, Leeds. I'm from Leeds. Okay, right. Yeah. We should tackle that. Paul, you were the one who was dubious about the electorate. No, I'm not dubious about it at all. Uh, what I was simply, I, I was trying to explain is I thought we ought to start with a draft bill that deals with what is absolutely clear to everybody, just did not work in 2016, and then we can amend it if we feel, Parliament feels, that, for example, the franchise needs to be extended to those who are most affected. I don't know whether it's the case with other people in this room, but the day after the uh, referendum, I was uh, uh, emailed by my great nephew, I'm so old that I have a great nephew who is a voter, who said, your generation have sold my future. And thereafter, I developed the rather, I accept, maverick idea that everybody should be allowed as, as many votes as the actuaries say they are likely to have in terms of additional life beyond the date of the referendum. Yes. Uh, now, that perhaps is taking it to a, a slightly absurd degree. But as I said earlier, we did in the House of Lords put in 16, 70 year olds, and it was taken out by the Commons. We put in EU citizens in the UK, it was taken out by the House of Commons, and I th I'm not sure whether we won on the, on the uh, UK citizens in uh, the EU, but we certainly had a good go at that, and it was taken out by the House of Commons. I think Parliament's got to decide in the end, and we've got to all accept the outcome of that, because we can't afford months and months of toing and froing on this issue. And it's so important to have better legislation in place better, but even if it's not perfect, better, that I think we cannot afford to let this drag on too long. So draft will go in, I think, so I'll see what my colleagues and other parties say when we look at this, without a major change to the franchise, but we will anticipate there will be amendments in both houses of parliament to, it, to increase it in the way that you would prefer. You were going to comment, Jesse, on that, okay. Are you going to take another question? Take another question. Come forward with you with the mic to this. There's a lady there, I think I can see. There you are. Sit down. Not a lady. This session is entitled The People's Vote, Doing It Properly. I, I have a simple question and maybe a more complex follow-up. The simple question is, how can we be sure that the people's vote really will contain an option to remain when some of its supporters really just talk about it being what kind of Brexit we should have? And the follow-up is, is it possible or desirable, do you think, the panel, to have a multi-way choice that exposes the fractured nature of leave, even though, for fairness, it should probably then be an alternative vote? Well, that's a, a difficult one. Who wants to take that first? Um, shall, I, shall I have a... Uh, so, in terms of uh, how can we be sure that it will contain a, a vote to remain, um, we can't be sure of anything, and I completely agree with you. My, my view is that we should only be discussing two things, uh, Brexit or no Brexit. And I think that the no deal thing is a, a stalking horse. It's, it's just to make a situation where we're between uh, a blind Brexit and no deal. Um, and that's not on. But I do think that the people's vote eventually is going to have to come out on that and has not done so yet. And, and I myself find that frustrating. Um, on the multi-way choice, 
uh, very difficult. It would obviously have to be possibly a two-stage referendum or a, a counting, a uh, value counting. Uh, and it would assist the Remain and therefore have accusations of being unfair. So I suppose that would be the problem uh, in it. Yes, I'm, I'm emphatically of the view that it has to be binary, that a, a multi-way referendum would just introduce a lot of confusion and, and you know, uh, uh, fudge. We can't do that. We must have a binary uh, vote on it. Uh, but I also think, uh, however, that, that um, the... Uh, the, 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 the real danger that we face is that people get exhausted with the whole Brexit debate and then some sort of fudgy two-page, let's kick it down the road kind of semi-Brexit happens uh, and, then, and then, you know, we're just stuck with uh, the problem we've already identified. I have to say that um, the, the demand that there be clarity and something definite so that we know exactly where we are, even if... Even if it were to, to, to turn out, which I very much doubt, that people say, I, I vote to continue this process. Let's, let's delay Article 50 again. Let's, let's give ourselves another couple of years to work out what exactly a Brexit would be and so on. Even if people went down that road, um, it would be better than, than the situation we're in now. And it would play into the fact that the demographics are changing dramatically in favor of Remain all the time. 1.3 million people have turned 18 since 2016, June 2016. Uh, a, a slightly lesser number of people have um, popped their clogs, as we say up here in these northern fastnesses, since that time. So we can be reasonably sure that as each moment ticks by, so the Remain majority grows. But it would be so much better if we had clarity, even better still if we were to stop Brexit. Thank you very much. I, I fear that it has to be the end of this session. I wish we could go on for another hour. There's a lot more to be said. But I want to thank our speakers very warmly. They've all trekked long distances to be here. The, the lady who commended them for their stalwart support of uh, United Europe, I think, is endorsed by everybody. And we thank Professor Grayling, Jessica Seymour, and, uh, and Paul Tyler. I ought to say after this now that Paul and I are members of the, the Whips Club from Parliament, and you can always rely on the whips to get the right thing through. So I hope that will happen. But thank you very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.